Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our evening service here at the Tron. We hope that uh, if you're visiting with us, you'll feel very welcome and uh, at home among us. Uh, please do stay behind afterwards. There'll be tea and coffee and uh, soft drinks and so on downstairs, uh, and an opportunity to meet and greet one another and encourage one another in the Lord. The psalmist of Psalm 16 says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. Well, we're going to be studying that psalm this evening as uh, Paul preaches to us, but we're going to sing to begin with a version of it. You'll find it, surprise, surprise, at number 16 in our blue books. O oh God, my refuge, keep me safe, on you my good depends. Number 16.
join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can say to you and of you, you are our refuge. You are our strength and our shelter, a sure and certain hiding place in times of trouble, a rock of refuge, a tower of great strength, one upon whom we can lean in all our distress and be sure that we shall find succor and safety and help. What a wonder it is, Lord, that we can come knowing these things of you, the God of all the earth, the maker of all that is seen and unseen. When we know that we are in ourselves so insignificant, so small, when we think of even just the living population of this world and its billions, what are we that you should remember us or even know our names? And yet your word tells us, and our Lord Jesus reminds us, that the very hairs on our heads are numbered and that we are so precious to you, more precious than many sparrows, each one of which also is in your care. And we marvel, Lord, at the magnitude of your love and your mercy towards us because not only are we small and insignificant one of millions, billions on this earth, but we know our own hearts. We know what we are and what we're not. So many things within us cry out or ought to cry out to say we are unworthy of you. We could not dream of drawing near to your holy presence, which is as fire, dangerous to unholiness and uncleanness. And yet, Lord, this mystery that is revealed to us in your word of your greatness and holiness and perfection and hatred of sin, and yet your mercy and your love and your faithfulness and your covering of our sin, this mercy will ever astound us. And yet we rejoice in it and glory in the message of your gospel that tells us that there is a way for us to draw near to you. There is a way and a path because you have made it through the extraordinary gift in Jesus Christ, your Son, who came and paid in his own blood the price of our sins, that we who were afar off might be brought near, that we might be called sons and daughters of the living God. So, Lord, as we marvel at your greatness and at your condescending mercy, we rejoice in your goodness, your love, and we rejoice in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we come to you tonight in his name, knowing that there alone is our assurance, there alone is our hope. And our prayer is that you would make known to us afresh the path of life that is in Jesus Christ, reminding us that in your presence and yours alone is the fullness of joy to be found. <coughs> But through him, that fullness of joy is ours, not only for this life, but forevermore in the wonder and the hope of resurrection from the dead. So draw near to us, Lord, we pray. And we humbly beseech you, O Father, mercifully to look upon our weakness and for the glory of your name, Turn from us all the evils that we have so rightly deserved and grant that in all our troubles we may put our whole trust and confidence in your mercy 
and evermore serve you in holiness and purity of life for your honor and glory and that of your name. And we ask all these things through our only mediator and advocate, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we sing again a hymn of the triumph of Jesus Christ our Lord. Number 291, Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Savior, Master, King. Number 291. Just uh, one or two notices to bring before you. Uh, do remember our Wednesday service, our lunchtime service this week. Terry will be preaching 1.15. Uh, do be praying for him. And uh, if you'd like to come along, there's lunch before and afterwards. And it's a great time to bring somebody in that time to hear the gospel uh, at lunchtime. Also on Wednesday evening at 7.30 is excuse me, our congregational prayer meeting. And uh, with many folk away on holiday at uh, this time of year, please do come along if you are here uh, and add your voice to those who will be praying for Christ's work, not only in our own fellowship, indeed mostly uh, for those that we partner with throughout the world and throughout uh, our own uh, country here, 7.30 on Wednesday. Please also pray for Stella, Stella and James, Stella Lee and James Duffus, who are being married on Saturday at uh, midday in the chapel at Glasgow University and they'd be very glad for anybody to come uh, and to join them at the service there and I'm sure uh, even if you're not able to be there you'll want to pray for them and their guests uh, for a day of happiness for them and also an opportunity of witness to the gospel of Christ to the many who will be gathered there uh, and congratulations to them 
Next Sunday, our service is at 9 at Kelvin Grove and at 11 here, as usual, uh, will be communion services and we'll meet again here at 6.30 as always. As I mentioned uh, this morning, our book for the summer is uh, by John Piper. It's a recent publication called A Camaraderie of Confidence. Uh, John Piper has published a number of little biopics and uh, this includes three little biographies, that of Charles Spurgeon, George Muller and Hudson Taylor, three uh, very influential evangelical leaders uh, of uh, the 19th century who all knew each other, had a great influence on each other and uh, it's a very inspiring read. Uh, they are remarkable people, there are many, many things in their lives that will not be like your life or mine. But nevertheless, one thing is common, and that is their God is our God. And of course, we share the same faith. And it's great to be inspired, isn't it, by the work of God in the life of others and what he enables them to do and uh, how he inspires trust in them. So those are on the bookstall. I saw a number of people picking them up this morning. But if there are some left, I really do recommend it as a great holiday read, uh, something to read yourself maybe and pass on to others. Well, uh, we're going to turn to our Bibles and to our reading for this evening, which, uh, as I've said, is in Psalm number 16. If you have one of our uh, Blue Church Visitors Bibles, that's page, I think, 453. If not, it's sort of near the middle of your Bible, and it's Psalm 16. And I'm sure... Certainly some of the verses will feel very, very familiar to you. In Psalm 16, we're told uh, at the beginning of verse 1 is a miktam of David, probably some kind of uh, musical uh, designation. A miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. And my flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. And may God bless to us his word. Well, there is a great hope in that psalm, isn't there, of life with God forevermore. And the New Testament explains to us in so much more detail what that means for us. We're going to sing now a hymn that uh, helps us to understand all of that. It's about the glorious resurrection morning of our Lord Jesus Christ. See what a morning gloriously bright with the dawning of that hope in Jerusalem.
Well, as the musicians play, we have a few moments of quiet as our offerings for the Lord's work are received. You might like to read and meditate again on these words of the psalm that we'll be studying shortly, or perhaps just be in prayer quietly. But as we do that, our offerings are received. pray. Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Lord, as we come to your word, we ask that you would be in our midst by your Holy Spirit, opening our eyes and opening the eyes of our hearts to take away the stubbornness, the deafness, the dullness, that we might hear you truly, that we might eat and drink from your word, which is life itself. So come to us, we pray, and bless us in this time for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his great glory we pray. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we sing the hymn on the screen, which is a prayer. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you.
Well, I don't know how you've arrived in church this evening, perhaps concerned and worried in the wake of the referendum results, unsure of how things are going to pan out, but our psalm puts all that in perspective for us this evening. So let me pray, and then we'll get stuck into the psalm. Father, would you please shape and fashion us in your likeness? Would your truth shape our minds, our attitudes, that we may with confidence stand on the promises of your word? So feed us this evening now. Speak, O Lord, as we come to your words, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please do have Psalm 16 open there in front of you. Now, this is a joyful, confident psalm. And yet, the subject at the core is about as serious as you can get. It's a subject that you perhaps wish wasn't on the agenda this evening. And the subject, the thing in view, is death. Steve Jobs once famously said in a speech, no one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to have to die in order to get there. And yet, death is the fate we all share. No one has ever escaped it. Now, you and I don't really like thinking about it. If you're like me, you tend to push it to the outer reaches of your conscience. Death is something over there. But deep down we know that it cannot be avoided. It is always there. And even though it's something that happens at the end of life, whenever that might be, the reality is that death casts its long shadow on every area of life. Every illness we face, every morning we wake up feeling tired, Death is casting its shadow, and we push it back as hard as we can. We try and push it back, but every so often, we are forced to face reality and look it square in the face. Perhaps it's an accident. Perhaps your health takes a serious turn for the worse. A close relative dies. We're faced with the reality that no matter how many precautions we take, how many diets we go on, no matter how many early morning jogs you inflict upon yourself, you must face up to your own mortality. Questions arise. Will I be okay? Am I secure? What hope is there for us in the face of trials, difficulties, national and political uncertainty, and ultimately, death. What hope is there? Well, here's one answer. It's a poem by Mary Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Does that give you hope? I trust not. That's just wishful thinking. Plain denial of reality. I did not die when you're there stood over the grave. What hope is there for you in the face of trials, difficulties, and ultimately death? Well, this psalm contains the answer, as we'll see this evening. You see, King David, who wrote this psalm, fears for his safety. He fears for his life even. Look at verse 1. Preserve me, O God. The NIV has, keep me safe, 
my God, guard me, keep me, protect me. For he fears for his life. Just cast your eye down to verse 10, what he has in view. You will not abandon my soul to shale, or let your Holy One see corruption. Death is the great thing hovering in the background in the psalm. And David is seeking security, safety. And although the basic issue in the psalm is deadly serious, there is real joy and confidence in this psalm. There is great confidence that in the Lord, David has refuge and safety. Just look at his utter confidence towards the end of the psalm. Verse 11 finishes the psalm with words of abundant, eternal, full life. How is David... God's anointed king able to say such things with such confidence? How can he be so sure that at your right hand, verse 11, are pleasures forevermore? How can David be so sure? Well, the psalm sets out the answer. God's anointed king can be sure of eternal security because he expresses decisive loyalty to God's. He can be sure of eternal security because he expresses decisive loyalty to the God who is able to provide eternal security in life. Now, before we take a closer look at the psalm, just a quick step back, and this will hopefully help us to understand how we apply the psalm to us. You see, the psalms were Israel's songbook. The people of God would sing these psalms in worship to the Lord. How would they have understood this psalm? A friend of mine, some years ago, played a song. She played it to me. And it's a song by Carly Simon, released in 1972. You may know it. It goes like this. You're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. Now, when it was played, I laughed. But then I quickly stopped, realizing the joke was on me. And perhaps as you had this psalm read out to you earlier, you thought it was all about you. Well, as I said, the people of God would sing these psalms in worship to the Lord. How would they have understood it? Well, you see, this psalm was not about Joe Bloggs' Israelites. But it was certainly applied to them because... It was a psalm about their king. This was a psalm written by and about King David, God's anointed king. He was Israel's king, and to quote one author, as it fares with the messianic king, so it fares with the messianic people. Whatever is true of the king is true of the people, because he's their king. If things are well with the king, things are well with the people. A faithful king meant a faithful Israel. A faithless king meant a faithless people. A loyal king meant a loyal people. So this is a good news psalm, not just for David, but also for his people. As it goes with the king, so it goes with each member of the kingdom. So then, two points in the psalm. Firstly, because God's anointed king expresses decisive loyalty, point one, he enjoys and his people enjoy definite life. Because God's anointed king expresses decisive loyalty, verses one to eight, he enjoys and his people enjoy definite life, verses nine to 11. Decisive loyalty and definite life. Decisive loyalty leads to definite life. So firstly then, God's anointed king expresses decisive loyalty. It's really quite striking to notice the single-minded loyalty that David has here towards his God. Just notice all the eyes and mys through the psalm. It is intensely personal. And he, David, the anointed king is expressing his single-minded, decisive loyalty. What David wants more than anything else 
is the Lord. He wants him. Look at verse 1. Preserve me, for in you I take refuge. Verse 2. You are my God. I have no good apart from you. Verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Verse 7. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. In every area of life, David throws his lot in with the Lord. In all these areas of life, David demonstrates his single-minded loyalty. He's saying, I align myself with the Lord. The Lord and the Lord alone is all I need. Crystal clear, decisive loyalty. In all sorts of areas of life, his security, his welfare, his associations... Look at verse 1. He expresses his security. David is in fear of his life. He needs preservation. And he seeks it from the Lord. It is in the Lord that David seeks refuge. No hedging bets. No backup. No cozying up to other kings in case the Lord doesn't pull through. No, in you I take refuge. His welfare, verse 2, It's quite a stunning thing to say, isn't it? That I have no good apart from you. All the good things that David has in life, everything good is found in the Lord. The Lord is the source of all good things that David enjoys. Verses 3 and 4 speak of David's associations. You see, loyalty to God is not just expressed in the vertical relationship between David and the Lord. It bears out on the horizontal. Notice how David speaks about how he relates to two different groups of people. Verse 3, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom I delight. But on the other hand, verse 4, The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out. Or take their names on my lips. David is clear that he delights in God's people, but for those who run after other gods, he won't even take their name on his lips. Loyalty to God is demonstrated in associations with people. It's not just pious utterances, it has actual implications in day to day life for David. David's heritage, verses 5 and 6. David is trusting that his inheritance, his portion, his cup, his lot, is secure in the Lord. It is because of David's settled determination to be loyal to the Lord, to throw his lot in with him, to stand with him, that he is assured of his security. Notice the link between his loyalty and his safety, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. For David, God's anointed king, loyalty led to safety. That's the logic of the psalm. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. God has all of his affections and loyalties. And because David is locked tight to God, he knows that he is secure. He knows safety because he has sided with, thrown his lot in with the almighty God of all creation. David is loyal to God. There's our first point. Secondly, God's anointed king enjoys definite life. David sets out the reality of life with God, a life he is confident in because of his loyalty to God. And verses 8, 9, 10, and 11 are just overflowing with abundant life. Verse 8, we've already looked at his security. He will not be shaken, he's not going to be moved. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. 
Verse 10, you will not abandon my soul to shale or let your Holy One see corruption. David knows fullness of knife. Uh, look at verse 6, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. And then verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Astonishing certainty of life, definite life, everlasting life. And there's the hope of resurrection, verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, that is, the place of the dead. Or let your Holy One see corruption. Literally, my body won't rot in the ground. But how? It's all very well to read this psalm, to see that David says that loyalty to God leads to security in life. But it doesn't quite add up. We know that David wasn't ultimately loyal. One word throws up a whole heap of doubt on that, Bathsheba, the woman he saw bathing, who he took for his own and had his, her husband killed on the front line. David wasn't utterly loyal, and yet, on top of that, he died. David died, his body did see corruption. There's no record of his resurrection, how can this psalm be true? Well, remember who David was. He was the king of Israel. He was God's anointed king. And he is pointing us forward here to another king, a king who was ultimately loyal and whose body did not see corruption. Now, don't take my word for that. I'm not somehow pulling a magic rabbit out of a hat. Listen to Peter as he applies this psalm in the New Testament situation. Acts chapter 2. He says this, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says, and he quotes from Psalm 16, David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your, with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. According to Peter, David was, in Psalm 16, speaking about Jesus Christ, a greater David, the promised king, the one who was perfectly loyal to God and whose body did not see corruption. Jesus Christ was raised to life, as we've been singing about this evening. He now lives, reigning at the right hand of God. He was ultimately loyal. He knows definite life. 
And because of the decisive loyalty of Christ, because of his definite life, you and I can be sure of these things too as we seek refuge in our King. And that is simply wonderful, joyful news. Because Christ, the ultimate King, the greater David, has defeated death, all who are united to him can have confidence of life beyond death. All that is true of David here is true of you who are in Christ and all who take refuge in God. If you do not take refuge in Christ, if you do not take refuge in him and you're here tonight, then none of these promises of security, of refuge, of life, of pleasures forevermore, none of them are yours. None of them. How do you take refuge? Well, let me read on from Peter's speech in Acts chapter 2. The very next verses tell us how. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the same question is put to you. Will you repent? That is, will you turn away from your sinful rejection of the king of the universe? And will you turn to him in obedience and faith, trusting him for the forgiveness of your sins? There is a simple choice to be made. Are you with the king or are you against him? There is no alternative. There is no other place in which the sort of safety that David speaks about here can be found. No place where eternal security is to be held. There is no other place where death, the penalty for our sins, is fully dealt with. Will you seek refuge in Jesus Christ? He was the loyal king. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you are in Christ here this evening, then all that is true of our anointed king here is true of you. As it fares with the Messianic king, so it fares with each member of the Messianic kingdom. If you are part of the people of the king, if you are one of Jesus' people, then your hope beyond death rests in his perfect obedience. That is your great and only hope. It does not depend on your perfect loyalty. Nothing and no one can shake the security that you have in Christ. Nothing can take away the certainty of eternity with our God in the new creation. Nothing can take that away. Now that sort of refuge, that sort of eternal security is a great giver of perspective, isn't it? Particularly this week as a nation, we've been thrown into all sorts of political, economic uncertainty. This psalm sets those sort of concerns against eternal concerns. And as we see here, the security doors are unbreakable. Because Jesus is at God's right hand, he shall not be shaken, and neither will you. Are you worried about your pension pot after Thursday's referendum? Are you concerned about your children's future, wondering how it's all going to pan out for Britain? Well, this psalm tells you that you are safe in Christ You are safe in him when it comes to the ultimate matters, 
safe from life's greatest leveler. You are safe beyond death. This psalm promises for us who are in Christ eternal life, safety from God's wrath. You can be 100% secure and safe in life's biggest questions. And that is a wonderful thing, isn't it? All of us must face up to death in the end. This is our security. This is our safety. This is our refuge. As we think about that day, we must all face. But more than that, more than our ultimate safety in Christ as a follower of Jesus, you will be becoming more and more like him. As his spirit works in you, you are changed and changing. And so, although these words of decisive loyalty are ultimately true of Jesus, as his follower, you will perhaps find yourself wanting to echo these words yourself, beginning to feel the same way and wanting to utter similar words of loyalty to your king, to your Father in heaven. Might you be able to say, as David does, you are my God, I have no good apart from you. Do you find yourself wanting to say, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Each of us will be faced on a regular basis with choices to make, either to affirm our loyalty to God or to follow our own desires. Tempted to join in with those who run after other gods. Verse 4. Are you tempted to run after those gods too? It is tempting. Ten seconds on Facebook shows me what my contemporaries are able to enjoy. And it looks like fun. But tempted to join with them, will I say, as the psalmist does, those things ultimately lead to sorrow? Will I, will you, choose loyalty to God? By God's grace and work in our lives and hearts, you will be able to do that imperfectly, but with integrity. You will be able to utter similar words of loyalty, expressing decisive commitment to him, And as you do that, as you express decisive loyalty to God, you will know with ever greater confidence the certainty of definite life. But even if we fail, even if we falter, and we will, we have ultimate confidence, not because of ourselves, but because of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his decisive loyalty, because of his definite life, you and I can be sure of ultimate beyond death security because we find our refuge in Jesus Christ. He is our king. Our only hope in the face of inevitable death is that we have a king who is unfailingly loyal and who overcame death, whose body did not see corruption. As one of his people, you will not be shaken. Let me pray. The Apostle Paul in the letter to the Romans writes this, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great hope that this psalm gives us because it is a psalm about our great and loyal king, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who perfectly obeyed, who was perfectly loyal, and whose body did not see corruption. But he has been raised from the dead and reigns now at your right hand. What hope that gives us as we inevitably will one day die. We have a hope beyond death. And we thank you so much that it is rock solid, that in you we shall not be shaken. And so for our loyal king, we give you thanks in his name. Amen. Well, as we close our time together, we sing now of our great King, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Let's sing together. to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy 
To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.